Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, let me begin by thanking you again. <laughs> it's been about two weeks, two weeks for some of you, just one day of two weeks for the rest of you. Um, and as I said in my opening, uh, opening statement uh, two weeks ago, thank you, Mr. Harrison. I do appreciate the amount of time you've given to this case. Your dedication to this case is clear to both of us that you have been very diligent and attentive, and that's what we need to make this system work. So thank you very much. I want to begin my closing argument, and I'm sure the judge will tell you that what I say in my closing argument, what Mr. Bradley says in his closing argument, isn't evidence. If we say something about the evidence that doesn't agree with your collective memory, it's your memory that rules and not Mr. Bradley's or mine. But let me begin my closing argument by starting at a particular spot. Let me make one thing easier for you. Three of these indictments, three counts of this indictment, charge Mr. Harrison with possession of a rifle, possession of ammunition, and possession of a shotgun. As to those three counts, the ammunition that's found in the closet, the rifle that's found in the closet, the shotgun that's found in the closet, I would suggest to you the evidence in this case is that Mr. Harrison is guilty of those three charges. That may seem to you like an unusual concession to make, but I want you to think about it. And I want to think about the context that this is being done. Remember that on March 4th, 2015, the police go to English High School sometime in the afternoon and they meet Mr. Harrison there. And they take him back to Area B2 for an interview. And at 3.05 p.m., he signs a Miranda waiver form. And during the course of that conversation, one of the things they ask him is, do you have any guns at home? His response is, yeah, I do. I have a rifle and a shotgun at home. I, got, I inherited them basically from my parents. My mother passed away. My father didn't want him in his house. I used to have an FID card. It's expired, but I took them from the house. I brought them home. And they're in my house right now. Why is that important in this case, ladies and gentlemen of the jury? Because what the Commonwealth is alleging in this indictment is that less than 24 hours before Mr. Harrison made that statement, he shot and tried to kill Luis Rodriguez. If somebody had just shot and tried to kill Luis Rodriguez some 20 hours before, why would he be inviting the police into his home? He's just admitted to the police He's in possession of a fire, two firearms, and the ammunition is positive, and he doesn't have a valid FID card. He's just basically said, go to my house, you'll find those weapons. And that's not something, that's not the behavior of somebody who, you know, who tried to shoot somebody the night before, inviting him into his house so they could find evidence that might tie him to his crime. Think about that, ladies and gentlemen. That just not the behavior of a guilty man being guilty of trying to shoot from his property. So I'd ask you to keep that in mind. You don't need to think about those three counts of the indictment, the ammo in the closet, the rifle in the closet, and the shotgun in the closet. Right. If Mr. Harrison had, in fact, been the shooter of Willis Rodriguez, he would have been trying to deflect the police's attention from himself and from his house. If he had known those things were in his house, he would have deflected, tried to create a detour for the police. But instead, he essentially gave the police in to get into his apartment. And he, so the police go to his apartment, and in the basement, in a, sto in a storage bin, they find some other items that they charged him with being in possession of. There's a 38 caliber firearm, there's some marijuana down there, things of that nature. Think about it, ladies and gentlemen of the jury. Has anybody testified in this case that that storage bin where they found those items belong to Sean Harrison? I think you can explore your collective memory. You'll realize the answer to that question is no, nobody ever has. The police say they talked to some people, and they say they get a search warrant for a storage bin in the basement, but nobody has ever identified that storage bin as belonging to Sean Harrison. 
to think about what the police then find inside that storage bin, and more importantly, inside the safe, which is where most of this material is recovered. Ms. Pagano, before I move on to what's in the safe, Ms. Pagano took the witness stand today, took the witness stand during the course of this trial. It would have been very simple for the Commonwealth to say to Ms. Pagano, here's that picture of the storage areas in the basement. Which one was yours? Which one, who did the other two belong to and which ones belong to who? But that was never done. We don't know who those storage bins belong to, even if they belong to or used by the people in the building. So what's inside the safe? Well, we know there's a Goodwill bag inside the safe that has Sean Harrison's fingerprint on the outside of it. We also know inside that bag is there a receipt from Goodwill that's dated 2012. What does that tell you about Mr. Harrison's knowledge of anything inside that safe or his intent to what we call exercise dominion and control over anything inside that safe? Pretty much nothing. The man from the crime lab who came in and testified about fingerprints couldn't tell you when those print was there, where it was, where the items were, when the fingerprints were put on it, how long the fingerprints had been on it. Mr. Harrison's fingerprint was also found in one of the plastic bags. But again, when, where, how that happened, no information whatsoever. But think about what's inside that safe. How many boxes of ammunition and trays of ammunition were found in that safe? I'll leave it to your memory. I can't tell you off the top of my head. But there are a good number. And what did we find? What did the criminals find on those boxes? Fingerprints. And whose fingerprints were they? Dante Laura and Matthew Palacios. We've all heard some testimony about Matthew about Dante Laura in this case. He's one of the three individuals who was seen leaving. 18 Pompeii Street on the 4th of March, along with Mr. Pagaro and Mr. Pena. And he's one of the three people who was stopped and searched by the police and found to have guns and drugs on him. You haven't heard anything about Matthew Palacios other than his fingerprints were present. But more importantly than his fingerprint, because that fingerprint could have been put there anytime, anywhere, anyhow. We don't know. But what's most important is the personal papers that are inside that safe. That tells you who's got dominion and control, the intent to exercise dominion and control over what's in that safe. Matthew Palacios has in that safe his social security card, his Massachusetts ID, and his birth certificate. That should tell you volumes about who's property that was inside that safe, inside that storage bin that's never been connected to Sean Harris. Now the Commonwealth has presented this case in such a way that it wants you to believe that somehow Mr. Harrison was in cahoots with Mr. Laura, Mr. Pagaro, and Mr. Pena. And what are they going to use to point to that? They're going to use to point to that this text that shows up on one of the phones. Get out house. That on the phone is texted at 4.02 p.m. on March 4th. You have, you'll have it with you in the jury room. And you're probably already aware of it. That Mr. Harrison signed that Miranda form at 3.05 p.m. He's effectively been in police custody, if you will, since even before 3.05, because he was taken from English High School to Area B2. So sometime in the early, mid afternoon, 2.30 or 2 o'clock on the 4th, Mr. Harrison becomes effectively in the control of the Boston Police Department. You have the video upstairs when you go to deliberate. And you'll see that Mr. Harrison makes these statements about his guns and some other things. 
But you'll also see, as you probably did, that the police leave Mr. Harrison alone in that room for a period of time. He's got his coat with him. And you see him move his coat a little bit. And you see him sit there. He's just been asked about Luis Rodriguez. And he's just been asked about guns. And he had an opportunity, and he had the desire to text anybody to get out of house that would have been it. But there is no video that shows that. The police come back into the room and they take him out. That will show in the video, but he's again expectedly in police custody. And the police are with him or he's on video that entire time and there's no indication that he texted anybody to get out of house. And you know that Mr. Piguero, Mr. Pagan, I'm sorry, Mr. Piguero, Mr. Pena, and Mr. Lara have these guns and drugs on them. You also heard from Officer uh, Mason, Detective Mason, Sergeant Mason, that they had $1,700 on them. I would suggest to you that they have dominion and control over what's in the basement, not Mr. Harrison and that they're the ones who are responsible for the guns, the drugs, and things of that nature in that safe. The Commonwealth has not proven the other reason without any of the indictments that charge him with that behavior. The remaining indictments against Mr. Harrison all relate to allegations that something occurred on March 3rd. 2015. And I think we all understand that Luis Rodriguez was shot on March 3rd, 2015, sometime between 7 and 7.30 in the evening in the area of 100 Magazine Street. The question is, who shot him? Mr. Bradley, in his opening statement to you, tried to suggest to you that the reason for this shooting was that there was a big disagreement between Mr. Rodriguez and Mr. Harrison. It was supposedly somehow connected to Louis Rodriguez selling drugs for Mr. Harrison. Did you hear any evidence at all from Louis Rodriguez that there was any problems between Mr. Rodriguez and Mr. Harrison? No. In fact, he said everything was cool between him and the Red. There were no problems. Mr. Bradley had brought up on his redirect something about uh, some joints that have been missing or some blunts that were missing. Mr. Rodriguez acknowledged that it had come up, but everything was cool, that there was no problems between him and Mr. Harrison. It wasn't him. So what's the motive here for Mr. Harrison to shoot and try to kill Louis Rodriguez? And you've also heard some testimony from Mr. Arias, Mr. Perez, people of that, um, and perhaps uh, Mr. Nova, about uh, statements that Mr. Harrison's alleged to have made to them about why he wanted Lewis killed. And he said that their statements are he wanted Lewis killed because Lewis was um, shorting Mr. Harrison on money. He was skimming money off the top. That's it. Lewis completely denies that. Where do these witnesses come up with that statement? Those, Mr. Harrison never did that. If there were some truth to it, Mr. Rodriguez would have been the best source of information, and he would have told you that, that he told you everything was cool. In fact, he used the term, I never effed up. So there's no reason for Sean Harrison to seek anybody out to shoot and kill Louis Rodriguez. Mr. Rodriguez is shot a little bit after 7 o'clock. The first people he sees are Mr. Bullock and Ms. Strickland. And he spends approximately five minutes or so with them before anybody else shows up. And he told you he was calm during that time. And you heard testimony from Mr. Strickland and Ms. Oh, I'm sorry, Ms. Strickland and Mr. Bullock that Mr. Rodriguez could not identify anybody as who shot him didn't know who shot him. You also know from the testimony of Mr. Rodriguez and Mr. Bullock 
that there was enough time to have a conversation with Mr. Rodriguez about did he have anything on him. And Mr. Rodriguez is cool enough and control enough and smart enough to realize that he has a knife on him. And he takes the knife out of his pocket and he throws it away. He doesn't say anything about who shot him, the rev, anybody from him was high, anybody that he's working for, anything like that. The EMTs are the next people on the scene. And you know from the EMTs testimony in this case that when they evaluate Mr. Rodriguez, he's oriented times three. You know that the bleeding is e easily controllable. And you know that they put in their report that Mr. Rodriguez doesn't know who shot him. Unknown shooter. The cops then arrive, the police then, sorry, the police then arrive on the scene. <clears throat> and they tell you, they're so concerned about Mr. Rodriguez's well-being that they don't even ask him who shot him. I ask you to consider that, ladies and gentlemen. You heard the officer testify that that's one of the things that they're first trained to do. Get, find out who the suspect is, find out what the description is, and go from there. They didn't do that, according to them, if you believe that. I would suggest that that's not credible, especially after Mr. Rodriguez has already had this conversation with Mr. Bullock and Mr. Herman. He's in control, he's calm. Who shot you is a simple question, and a one-word answer of red is a simple answer, and it never happens with the police. In Mr. Bradley's opening statement to you, he said that the first person that he told who had shot him to, he said, Mr. Rodriguez had said, it was his aunt in the middle of the night or sometime in between the third and the fourth. I would suggest to you that's not true either, because you've got a chance to hear that phone call. And what, in fact, Mr. Rodriguez said to the aunt was he got his weed from Mr. from the Rev. Not that Mr. That, Mr. that the Rev shot him or anything like that whatsoever. Detective Diaz came in and testified about conversations he had with Mr. Rodriguez. And he tells you that on the day of the, the night of this shooting, sometime after 7.30, he has a conversation with Kevin, I'm sorry, with Louis Rodriguez. While Mr. Rodriguez is on a gurney and screaming in pain and blood flowing out of his ear, even though the blood is easily controllable. The blood flow is easily controllable according to the And then, Detective Diaz tells you what Lewis supposedly said to him. I'm sorry. I wanna, there's one other thing I want to say about it. I'll do this one. The Detective Diaz is speaking to Lewis Rodriguez. And during the course of this interview, Mr. Diaz supposedly says to him a variety of things. Gives the name Rev, gives an age 50, gives nothing about um, height, weight, color, build, anything like that. And he then tells you the whole story about what Mr. Rodriguez is saying during this interview after the CAT scan. He's supposedly walking down Mad Sav, that they were on their way to see some women and smoke some weed, that um, <clears throat> they had started down at McDonald's and were walking from then, um, and that he told the detective that Brad had shot him. Well, we then had Detective Diaz look at his notes of what his conversation with Mr. Rodriguez consisted of practically contemporaneously with the conversation. He gets the name Rev, man in his 50s, <coughs> that he was selling for the Rev, and he was, but he never messed up. He was walking with a suspect, and that the suspect was somebody that he'd met on Mass Ave, or maybe lived near Mass Ave. Nothing in there about the Rev shot him. Nothing about the pain. Doesn't, nothing about not knowing why he was shot. 
nothing about walking from Mass Ave on the phone within its context with we, nothing about a name. In fact, he says he didn't even know the name of Sean Harrison on the night of the 7th. I would suggest to you, Mr. Detective Diaz, this can mixing conversations he allegedly had. Detective Diaz didn't even write the report about this interview until three days later. And in the meantime, he has another conversation with Mr. Diaz where he supposedly gets more information. And he now says he gets the name Sean Harrison from Mr. Diaz. And the question then becomes, where did, between the time of the interview after the CAT scan and the next day, who has put the name Sean Harrison in Luis Rodriguez's head? Wasn't there before. He didn't know that Sean Harris was named before. But now the detective Diaz is getting supposedly more information. And he writes the report on the March 4th incident interview at the same day that he writes the about the interview on the 3rd. I would suggest to you in none of those conversations did Mr. Diaz ever say that <clears throat> Red shot him. In fact, when Mr. Rodriguez was on the stand, he testified that he, he didn't know who had shot him, he didn't, he didn't see the face who had shot him, and he didn't believe in anything about what had happened. But he didn't ever say, Sean Harris and the Reverend shot me during that interview. Those are, Mr. Those are Detective Diaz's words, not Louis Rodriguez's words. You have one other source of information about what Luis Rodriguez was telling people about the person who shot him in the, early, in the days immediately, the day of or immediately after the uh, shooting. You'll have in front of you, in the jury room, the medical records. And I'm going to direct your attention particularly to what's now marked as Exhibit 28A of the medical records. It's page 145 of the medical records. And you will see that what Lewis Rodriguez told the hospital staff was that he was selling marijuana, and after another male purchased from him, he, meaning the other male, walked behind him and shot him in the head from behind. That's what he tells the hospital personnel about who shot him in the area of 100 Magazine Street. I would suggest to you that has to raise doubt in your mind about what Mr. Rodriguez had said to anybody else. This is a version that Mr. Rodriguez told the hospital staff who were treating him and wanting to save his life. And that's what he said. Somebody had just purchased from him, and that person walked behind him and shot him in the head. So I would suggest to you, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, <clears throat> that in order to convict Mr. Harrison of these crimes that have allegedly occurred on the 3rd, you need some other information that would permit you to believe that Sean Harrison, and believe beyond a reasonable doubt, that Sean Harrison shot Louis Rodriguez. I heard any number of stories, any number of, any amount of testimony about this jacket that's found in Ms. Figueroa's um, locker. It's a jacket. How many of those jackets have been sold in the greater Boston area? How many of them exist? Nobody knows. There's supposedly an emblem on it that, they, that reflects nothing that was ever described by Louis Rodriguez. He says the person who shot him was wearing a hoodie, or a jacket with a hood. There's nothing on that jacket that ties Mr. Rodriguez and Mr. Harrison to the shooting. There's no DNA taken from it. There's gunshot residue, but the, the gunshot residue expert couldn't tell you when it was placed there, how it was placed there, or who placed it there. <coughs> Where's the blue sweatshirt, ladies and gentlemen of the jury? The police say, often Sergeant Mason says, Detective Mason says that he took the blue sweatshirt from the 
that storage bin, and that was supposed to be sent for testing. At least gunshot residue testing. We know that that was never tested, and we also know it was never sent to DNA analysis. Well, if you've got a blue sweatshirt that, according to Detective Mason, was worn underneath this black jacket, why wasn't that sent? That's the coat. That's the wearing apparel that would have been closest to the person's skin that you're going to get where your DNA from. But you don't have that. You can use that in considering whether or not the Commonwealth is proved beyond a reasonable doubt. What else would you think that you might need to corroborate whether or not? Mr. Ver, Mr. Rodriguez tells you he's been inside Mr. Harrison's apartment at least on two occasions. Once when he went into the basement, the first time he ever got marijuana from Mr. Harrison about two weeks before the shooting. And what did he describe about the basement? Somebody goes into a basement, and the only thing he says is, there's a washer on one side, there's a dryer on another side, there's a black stool. Well, we know from the pictures of the, that were taken by the crime scene response unit that the washer and dryer are side by side, that there are lots of extra equipment and things propped up against one wall, that there are water heaters, there are furnaces all down there, there are storage bins down there, something that Louis Rodriguez never made mention of. I would suggest to you that's because he's never been in that basement. You also heard Mr. Rodriguez tell you that that happened at night, and he gets about an ounce from Mr. Harrison. And then he checks with his friend, and he gets a scale, and he weighs it, and he calls Mr. Harrison to say, oh, it's short. Look at the phone record. The phone record shows that that phone call, that text, whatever you want, it was a text, I believe. It's sometime at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. It's not nighttime, ladies and gentlemen, jury. So those can't be, you can't reconcile those things. Louis Rodriguez was never in that case. You've also heard Louis Rodriguez say he's been inside that apartment at, at 18 Palm Patriot. But Louis Rodriguez can't describe the front of the building to you, how tall the building is, how many units there are, that there's a grate, and then a hallway with mailboxes and a wooden door that you all have to go through before you even get into the apartment. The only thing he can tell you about the apartment is that there's a mural and a kitchen. And that's why he knows, that's how he knows Sean Harrison's apartment. He doesn't mention anything about the rest of the apartment. He doesn't mention where the bathroom is. He can't tell you where the bathroom is. He can't tell you where the bedroom is. Take a look at the photographs that the police took inside the apartment. Look at the throw that's on the couch. Look at the hats that are hung on the wall. If somebody had been inside that apartment, they would have noticed that, they would have seen it, they would have remembered it, they would have told the police about it. What did Luis Rodriguez tell Detective Diaz about the mural on the John Harrison wall? He had seen it on his friend Nene's Facebook page. He hadn't been inside that apartment. It makes a better story if he's inside the apartment, but it isn't true. Because what he really did is he, and this is what he told Detective Diaz, I saw it on any Facebook page. <clears throat> so what else does the <coughs> leads? The Commonwealth wants you to take this coat that has some similarities to a coat of somebody on the street. That doesn't identify who's on the street with Mr. Rodriguez. But the coat is not reliable enough by itself. What you have to do is match these gloves that they say they took from Sean Harrison. Detective Williamson tells you he takes gloves, phone, Charlie card, all that from Mr. Harrison at the time of the interview. He doesn't document in a report or anything like that. And they have these gloves. And I would suggest to you they're pretty distinctive gloves. But what can John Kelly tell you about those gloves? You see those gloves in the still that he said. Those gloves have a white line across them, have white brand name or something at the bottom, and a white logo on the on about the knuckle area. That doesn't appear at all in those photographs. So there's no corroboration from, from the gloves that that of Sean Harrison's that those are the gloves of the person who was 
with Luis Rodriguez on the third. Also think about the video. The video doesn't show the faces of anybody. So you can't identify who took Luis Rodriguez in any of those videos. But remember what Mr. Kelly told you, the forensic video man from the DA's office and the FBI. A couple of the clips that you're going to see and have already seen were taken of an individual walking on Pompeii Street. Mr. Kelly told you that was from a camera at 18 Pompeii Street. A camera at 18 Pompeii Street that sees somebody walk by 18 Pompeii Street. If that person who he tracks was Sean Harrison, you would have seen the video that shows Mr. Harrison leaving the building to go meet Los Rodriguez, and you would have seen him coming back and entering the building after being with Louis Rodriguez. But you don't have that, because whoever that person was did not come and go from 18 on Page Street. So there isn't corroborating evidence that you can use to bolster Mr. Louis Rodriguez telling you that Sean Harrison shot him. He's not there reasonable doubt. Who was that person? Other than Luis Rodriguez saying so, and Luis Rodriguez denying it any number of times, he said in his interview on the 4th of March, I thought it was somebody else. Not Sean Harris. I thought it was somebody else. Was that somebody else, the man who just sold weed to and walked behind him and shot him? That's, a, that's what he told the hospital staff. So there, I would suggest to you that independent of Luis Rodriguez's statements, there's nothing that you can rely on to identify Sean Harrison as the person who Lewis that night. Lewis tells you about some texts that were sent between the end of school and meeting with the person he says is Sean Harrison. Those texts, it's like from 4.50 p.m. on the 3rd, there are no texts between Sean Harrison and Lewis Rodriguez. So where are there's nothing to corroborate what Lewis says about Sean Harrison being a shooter. That's reasonable doubt. That's a reason to acquit. Let's talk and uh, try to wrap up for a here. <coughs> What's the whole backstory behind this? The Commonwealth wants to believe that Sean Harrison is recruiting people at English High School to sell drugs for him. Well, you've heard from various witnesses. You've heard from Luis Rodriguez. You've heard from Luis Arias. You've heard from Kevin Perez. You've heard from Jose Nova. What I want you to think about most in evaluating the testimony of those individuals first is some of these people either got immunity or told they weren't going to be prosecuted. So as long as they said what they thought the DA's office wanted to hear, wanted to hear or the police wanted to hear, they were fine. No problems. You also know that at least a couple of them lied to the police, at least initially. And Mr. Arias tells everybody he can talk to, at least initially, that this fight with Lewis was all about his mother. You, have to, you would have to believe that within a day or two of meeting Sean Harrison for the first time, Lewis Arias and Kevin Perez were being recruited by Sean Harrison not only to sell drugs for him, but also to fight Lewis Rodriguez. Supposedly, back with, Lewis, I mean, with Mr. Arias, he says at the beginning of February that he was being recruited to sell and or fight for three blunts. Fight a guy he's known for years, fight a guy whose families know each other, fight a guy for three points and never asked again. You have to believe that Sean Harrison would go up to these people he's had virtually no contact with his entire life and say, I want you to sell drugs for me, I want you to fight Louis Arias because he's cheating me on the drugs. Does that make sense to you when a man jeopardizes his job at English High School by recruiting kids within five minutes? not within five minutes in one day, but over a course of time, all they needed to do 
after a conversation like that, after they say they see drugs and rifles and guns and knives in his office, go to the school police, go to the headmistress and say, Sean Harris and the Rev is doing this. They didn't do that. You'd have to believe that Kevin Perez went through a three-hour interview with the police and never mentioned what he told you. He told you that Sean Harrison tried to recruit him and Jose Nova to kill Louis Rodriguez. They both supposedly declined. Jose Nova said that never happened. They were in the room together, and Jose Nova said that never happened. And think about it, if it had happened, Rodriguez, Arias, Nova, Perez, they're all buddies, they're all pals. You know one of your friends is going to get shot, somebody's gunning for him. You go, you at least go tell the person who's going to get shot, but they didn't. You might even consider going to the police or the school principal, but they didn't. And the reason they didn't is because that's not what happened. Kevin Perez came in here and told you that supposedly after he and Mr. Nova declined to shoot Lewis Rodriguez, Sean Harrison says, well, I'm going to kill him tonight. You're killing a couple of 15, 16-year-olds that you're going to kill somebody that night? people that you don't really know, people who don't have any, any obligation to you, have no loyalty to you, nothing. You're telling him, I'm going to kill Louis Rodriguez that night? No. He then, he doesn't say that to the police when he's interviewed after three hours. He doesn't say to the police what he told you was the whole scenario that Sean Harrison supposedly set out. I'm going to meet Louis at the, at the Mass Ave T station on the Orange Line. We're going to get on the train, and I'm going to take him someplace where the police can't see us, and I'm going to shoot him in the back of the head. He apparently never said a word of that to Detective Diaz, and I'm suggesting to you the reason he didn't is because that never happened. When he spoke with Diaz, he knew he wasn't going to be prosecuted for anything. There was no reason to prosecute him for this. He said, supposedly said no. He never said that to Diaz. It wasn't true. Sean Harrison never tried to recruit anybody to shoot and kill Louis Rodriguez. He had no reason for anybody to kill Louis Rodriguez. None. And what did Mr. Perez tell the police that he first put it tell the police about what he knew about who was getting shot. He said that his friend Reese had told him that Lewis was going to get shot. Not Sean Harris. Ladies and gentlemen, jury. I'm going to finish now. As I said, the rifle, the shotgun, the ammunition found in his apartment, Mr. Harris was guilty of told you that in his interview. As to the rest, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, there is more than reasonable doubt in this case. More than a reasonable doubt. And that's why you need to find Mr. Harrison not guilty in the